Hey guys, hope everybody's doing all right. This is a lecture about the poems we read for today. Um, I'm not going to edit this. I'm just going to go straight through and talk about the poets, the poems, what I'd like you to remember about each one. The first one is uh, The Leap by James Dickey. Um, follow along when I go through these poems so you can uh, keep track of the lines I'm talking about when I mention them. But a little biography. Dickie's the guy that wrote the movie Deliverance. If you've never seen it, it's beautiful but horrific. Meaning there's a scene where Ned Beatty's character gets uh, how shall we say this uh, manhandled by some hillbillies and they make him quote squeal like a pig. But it's so much more than that. It's a beautiful novel. Dickie, who was a bit of a prima donna actually demanded to be in the movie and was very aggressive towards the uh, everybody, the director, the actors. He got a small bit part in the movie as a sheriff, but uh, it came out in 1972, and Google Dueling Banjos if you get a chance, or look them up on YouTube. It's one of the songs that you'll probably recognize when you hear it. But Dickie taught at USC, and because of Deliverance, he became a bit of a celebrity, and as I said earlier, a prima donna, and he demanded certain things. You know, I had a fridge, supposedly, in one of his classrooms filled with Heineken that he could, so he could drink beer while giving his lectures, but he was a great poet. Um, the Leap is about memory, and it's about death, and it's about kind of staying innocent. She says, the only thing I have Jane McNaughton is one instant of a dancing class dance. She was the fastest runner in the seventh grade. My scrapbook says, even when the boys are beginning to be as big as the girls, but I do not have her running in my mind, though Francis Lane is there, Agnes Frazier, Fat Betty Lou Black, and the Boys Against Girls relays we ran at recess. She must have run. So he's remembering this girl, Jane McNaughton, from seventh grade, who he was friends with, and he's talking about how the girls in his class went through puberty way before the boys. The boys are still kind of like, ew, ick, girls. And, but the girls are maturing a little bit more. Um, we'll get to why he's remembering her, why he's thinking about this girl who... Seventh grade was a long time ago. He was probably in his 40s when he wrote this thing. The next stanza. Like the other girls with their skirts turked up, Sorry, like the other girls with their skirts tucked up so they would be like bloomers. But I cannot tell. That part of her's gone. What I do have is when she came with the hem of her skirt where it should be for a young lady into the annual dance of the dancing class we all hated. And with a light, grave leap, jumped up and touched the end of one of the paper ring decorations. You see that foreshadowing in there with grave leap. It's a very morbid word. But uh, you know what he's talking about, those paper rings that you make for a dance or something, construction paper, stapled. Just uh, he, he remembers her jumping up and tagging that thing, leaping up in the air and snagging it, or just popping it. It's what he remembers. He doesn't remember how fast she was, just her jumping up in the air like that. And that's going to tie into the what happens to Jane a little later. We got a little bit of a poetry... Uh, term here, enjambment, where the stanza ends, but it keeps going. So I'm going to go back to stanza two, because it blends into stanza three. Uh, and with a light grave leap, jumped up and touched the end of one of those paper ring decorations to see if she could reach it. She could, and reach me now as well, hanging in my mind from a brown chain of brittle paper, thin and muscular, wide mouth, eager to prove whatever it proves when you leap in a new dress, a new womanhood among the boys whom you left easily in the left in the dust of the passionless playground. So, passionless playground, not only great alliteration there with the double P sound, but again, the boys aren't into girls yet. There's no passion, there's no romance, there's no sexuality, it's just kids, more or less. At least half of them are kids. And he remembers her, she's like, it's almost like somebody took a snapshot of her jumping in the air and grabbing that thing and it's frozen in his brain. It's stuck in the middle of his brain. The last line of that stanza, if I said I saw in the paper where Jane McNaughton Hill, mother of four, leapt to her death from a window of a downtown hotel and that her body crushed in the top of a parked taxi and that I held, without trembling, a picture of her lying cradled in that papery steel as though lying in the grass, 
one shoe oddly off, arms folded across her breast, I would not believe myself. I would say the convenient thing, that it was a bad dream of maturity to see that eternal process most obsessively wrong with the world, come out of her light, earth-spurning feet, grown heavy. I would say in the dusty heels of the playground, some boy who did not depend on speed of foot caught and betrayed her. Jane, stay where you are in my first mind. It was odd in that school dance, at that dance. I and the other slow-footed yokel sat in the corner, cutting rings out of drawing paper. Uh, so he's imagining, he hadn't caught up with this girl in, since seventh grade, probably. And he's like, man, eh, somebody caught up with her. Somebody who was more of a Lothario than a speed racer and betrayed her, cheated on her. And even though she had a family, messed her up enough where she leaped off a hotel to her death. And I love, I really like the part where he says, Jane, stay where you are in my first mind. He's talking to the dead girl and saying, stay where you are in the seventh grade. Innocent, uh, not ruined yet by some fool. And I love also how he calls him, him and his buddies, his seventh grade pals, slow-footed yokels. Before you leapt in your new dress and touched the end of something, I began. That chain is what he's talking about there. You know? That little chain of construction paper is what he's talking about. Above the couple struggling on the floor, new men and women clutching at each other and prancing foolishly as bears. Hold on to that ring I made for you, Jane. My feet are nailed to the ground by dust I swallowed 30 years ago while I examined my hands. What he means at the end there? Just to see if they're shaken, to see if they're the hands of a 40-year-old man instead of a little kid. Uh, I mean, he keeps going back and forth between 7th grade and when he picked up the newspaper and read that piece about Jane, somebody he knew. Now, would they actually have a photograph of somebody who leaped off a building and smacked a taxi cab in the newspaper? I don't think so. I think that might be a little poetic embellishment right there. But it's a cool poem. Remember that about Dickie, too, that he was very macho. He was uh, from here, the low, not the low country, but he was from South Carolina. He uh, taught at USC. And most of his poems, when you get in, we get into the poetry anthology, a lot of his poems are about Mother Nature, uh, deer hunting, fishing. So if you like that kind of stuff, you might want to get into some of his poetry on poetryfoundation.org. Um, I'm going to pause this because my neighbor, for the 50th time today, decided to use a blower in the backyard. My favorite thing of all time, the blower. The next poem is called um, Barbie Doll by Marge Piercy. I don't know a lot about Marge Piercy. Um, this is her Mona Lisa right here, this poem. It's tragic. It's uh, sarcastic. It's ultimately very tragic poem. Um, the girl, This girl child was born as usual and presented dolls that did pee-pee and miniature GE stoves and irons and wee lipsticks the color of cherry candy. Then, in the magic of puberty, a classmate said, you have a great big nose and fat legs. So, it starts off, she's perfectly normal. She's uh, born as usual. No, nothing else anybody could ever ask for. She's healthy. She gets all those toys that a kid in the 50s or 60s or 70s would have gotten. The very feminine and somewhat patriarchal toys in the sense that the domesticated woman. Stove, iron, lipstick. Uh, and then, when she says, of course, the magic of puberty, she's been really smart-alecky and sarcastic because it's brutal. It's a war zone of hormonal uh, mishmash. Some jackass in her class just walks by and goes, hey, you have a great big nose and fat legs. Just some drive-by insult that he probably doesn't even remember. But to her, it sticks in her craw and it can't, it festers. It festers like a cancer. It stays with her her whole short life. She was healthy, tested intelligent, possessed strong arms and back, abundant sexual drive, and manual dexterity. She went to and fro apologizing. Everyone saw a fat nose on thick legs. They don't, but in her brain she thinks everybody sees what that jackass said about her many, many moons ago, or many weeks ago, many months ago, however long ago it was that he made the comment. And she thinks that she's got to apologize for it, even though she's perfectly healthy, normal, intelligent, just a what every parent asks for when they have a kid. 
uh, she thinks of herself, I don't know if you've seen that ear, nose, and throat commercial. It's local. It's this giant nose walking around with tiny little legs. In her head, that's what she sees herself as. But she's not. She's normal. She was advised to play coy, exhorted to come on hardy, exercise, diet, smile, and wheedle. Her good nature wore out like a fan belt. So she cut off her nose and her legs and she offered them up. I love that line, her good nature wore out like a fan belt, because, man, I don't care if you're driving a cheap 25-year-old Toyota or a, you know, Lamborghini. Fan belt goes out, you're on the side of the road. You're stuck, and it just, it dies. It abruptly stops. There's been some discussion as to whether she goes to a, a doctor who botches the operation, or if she does it herself. I think she does it herself, personally. I think she actually cuts off her nose and her legs and offers them up. Um, again, some people have suggested maybe that she suffered some sort of illness or infection after going to the doctor for plastic surgery, but I think she, I think she mutilates herself. I've always thought that about this poem. Here's the last stanza. In the casket displayed on satin she lay with the undertaker's cosmetics painted on, a turned up putty nose dressed in a pink and white nightie. Doesn't she look pretty, everyone said? Consummation at last, every woman a happy ending. Again, incredibly sarcastic. Uh, she killed herself. And she's got a nose put on, a prosthetic nose where she'd hacked off her own. And of course legs, it doesn't matter in a coffin because the bottom part shuts. And again, she did this brutal thing to herself because of one drive-by comment from an insignificant roach of a person, somebody who she'll never care about or even think about later in life, had he not said this thing. And it drove her to this. It's about, I guess, society's perception of women. And Barbie doll, of course. You know, there's some lady, I'm sure, on the internet I've seen before who tried to make herself look like a Barbie doll. She tried to actually do the physical... Uh, dimensions of a Barbie doll to a real human body and it looks ridiculous it looks like a fool a damn fool um, but this girl, she's perfectly healthy perfectly normal but society and, and just one comment one cancerous little comment sticks in her craw and it drives her to this point and at the end you know, again, you can see Marge Piercy saying this in a, with a very sarcastic tone to every woman a happy ending just like the magic of puberty, it's not a happy ending. It's brutal. She killed herself in a painful fashion when she was still an adolescent. Anyway, uh, please remember her good nature wore out like a fan belt. And those toys that she gets in the very first stanza, because they are so domesticated, if you know what I'm saying. They're all, for instance, I'm sure play school still, I'm sure they've corrected this, but I remember you could get, like, for a boy, a little boy, a doctor's kit and for a little girl it's like a nurse's kit you know that's that kind of political correctness has made that has go, made that go away but when this poem was written yeah toys for little girls were housewife and glamour toys next poem is morning song by sylvia plath uh sylvia plath killed herself she took her kids some cookies she put a towel under the door and then put her head in an oven. And it wasn't the kind of suicide where she baked her head. It was more like the gas, you know, the carbon monoxide or whatever from the oven is what killed her. Just like the hose in the mouth and the garage trick. Anyway, she was young. She was like 29 or 30 when she, when she passed at her own hand. And I know she had some issues. She had probably schizophrenia, uh, untreated, undiagnosed, probably... They didn't have the same kind of medication we have today for, for mental issues. Uh, she went on a downward spiral quickly in the last six months of her life. But a lot of people think this poem sort of should have been a hint or a clue because it's about the heaviness, the import of being a mother for the first time. She had a little girl, she had a child. And the child that's mentioned in this poem you see how she compares it to these things, these, uh, uh a fat gold watch, uh, an exhibit in a museum, the elements, uh, it means a lot. 
she doesn't know if she's prepared for it. You see that she's scared and frightened a little bit by having this beautiful thing, this child she's created. Is she ready to have it? But like Dickie's The Leap and like Marge Piercy's um, Barbie doll, there's no rhyme scheme in this thing. Uh, it's six pretty short stanzas, um, free verse. By the way, Sylvia Plath's husband, Ted Hughes, was a, an English poet. He was their poet laureate for a while. A bit of a rock star, really, in regards to poets back in the day when a poet could be like a rock star. And uh, he edited a lot of her stuff after she killed herself. Um, but let's talk about Morning Song. Love sets you going like a fat gold watch. Meaning, her and her husband doing it, creating this infant. Um, but fat gold watch. It's valuable. It's an automaton. I mean, if you've ever taken a watch apart... There's, I'm not wearing one. But anyway, th there's so much intricacy to the details and the mechanisms inside of a inside of a watch, and it's gold, one of one of our most precious metals. So already, just in the first line, this thing's up on a shelf. It's untouchable. The midwife slapped your foot soles, and your bald cry took its place among the elements again. Earth, wind, and fire. Not the band, but those things those forces of nature and bald cry you know also a little double meaning in the sense because babies are traditionally flat out bald when they're born our voices echo magnifying your arrival new statue in a drafty museum your nakedness shadows our safety we stand around blankly as walls don't know what to do you know um and again i don't know if they're in the hospital still or if they're in the in the the family's home in New York City, but it's a statue in a museum. Naked, of course, because babies are, but also because most classical statues are. And again, she's showing the intimidation she feels, the anxiety she feels by having this child. I'm no more your mother than the cloud that distills a mirror to reflect its own slow effacement at the wind's hand. Again, that same chiseling wind that creates something like the Grand Canyon. Um, just these giant forces of nature that create epical movements. All night your moth breath flickers among the flat pink roses. I wake to listen. A far sea moves in my ear. A moth breath, meaning almost imperceptible. It's just like this... Pip, pip, pip. There's, there's no meter that can even detect it. It's so minute. If you don't know what the flat pink roses are in this fourth stanza, we'll get to that in a minute. It's the nightgown that she's wearing. Um, and she's super, super conscious, super vigilant. She's waiting to listen to these noises. She has nothing to compare it to. But all she can hear is this far sea. Again, another monster of nature moving in her ear. One cry and I stumble from bed, cow heavy and floral in my Victorian nightgown. That's those uh, pink roses we were seeing in the previous stanza. And again, cow heavy. The, the child is a statue and a gold watch and uh, these elemental craftsmen from nature. And she's a cow. She's just had a child. She's cumbersome. Your mouth opens clean as a cat's. The window square whitens and swallows its dull stars. And now you try your handful of notes. The clear vowels rise like balloons. And again... You know, those vowels are just little baby noises coming out. But to her, they're taking their place with the stars in the heaven. They're going out of the windows, and they're rising up to meet with the rest of the galaxies and the cosmos, basically. And again, if this was just a poem, a one-off poem about an infant, it'd still be beautiful. But man, it's incredibly poignant to think about how this affected this somewhat disturbed Sylvia Plath and what wound up happening a few years after this poem was written when you put those two things together it's it's sad and poignant but uh, do remember that first line love sets you going like a fat gold watch and the last line the the one about the clear vowels rising like balloons um, just because both of those things are 
are precious and beyond compare. Now, the next poem, Seamus Haney's Digging. Seamus Haney, you'll see the picture of him on this discussion page. Obviously an Irishman. Uh, the prototype of the Irishman, in fact. He was, like Ted Hughes was for England, he was Ireland's poet laureate at one point in the 80s, I believe. But like The Leap, this is a poem about memory as well, about remembering things, but not about a girl from seventh grade, but dad and granddad. Haney uses a lot of duality, too, when he's talking about digging. I mean, he's talking about literal digging to get potatoes from the ground, but he's also talking about digging through the banks of memory as well. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. Yeah, he's trying to be a badass in this first stanza, you know, this gun reference, when he's talking about a pen here. And he later relents from that, and he later kind of goes off and says, I'll dig with it. He, towards the end of this poem, it becomes a spade, a shovel, rather than this gun. Under my window, a clean, rasping sound. When the spade sinks into gravelly ground, my father digging, I look down. Look at the alliteration. Spade sinks, gravelly ground. Double header in the second line of that stanza. And when he looks out of the window, he might literally see his old man digging. But he also might go back in time to when he was a little boy looking out of that same window seeing his dad digging. Time sort of evaporates in this poem. I look down till a straining rump among the flower beds bends low, comes up 20 years away, stooping in rhythm through potato drills where he was digging. So yeah, he has a flashback. He sees his dad and he's doing the same thing he did 20 years previously. He's digging up potatoes, which, you know, because of the troubles, because of the potato famine, it is the bare bone sustenance of the Irish, the Emerald Isle. It really is. I mean, you can ask my friend Patio Furniture in regards to how important the potato is to the Irish. Uh, the coarse boot nestled on the lug, the shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly. He rooted out tall tops, buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. Again, this ain't hobby gardening right here. This is sustenance. And the father's doing this. He's picking the, t the potatoes, but... It, Another generation previous is what had to set the scene for this. They had to lay down the, the soil, so to speak. They had to lay the peat and the bog for this stuff to grow out of. This wasn't a, a three-week operation. This is a generational process of having potatoes for this family. By God, the old man could handle a spade just like his old man. And with that short two-line verse, uh, he goes back another generation to his granddad and to thinking about remembering his granddad. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Toner's Bog. Once, I carried a milk in a bottle, corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving sods over his shoulder, going down and down for the good turf, digging. So again, the granddad's setting the scene for what the dad and future generations will reap the benefits from. He's, he's laying down the peat moss, the bog, uh, basically the foal that the crop is going to grow from. Um, again, this is not gardenias, this is not planting tub tulips or daffodils, this is survival right here. And there's nothing glamorous either about it. I mean, look at this second to the last stanza. The cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an edge through living roots awaken in my head. I've no spade to follow men like them. Man, kind of a nasty sense of mold but it's from that nastiness that grows this produce but man there's so much alliteration the squelch and slap of soggy peat the curt cuts of an edge I mean it almost is sharp like a shovel digging into the ground but I've no spade to follow men like them between my finger and my thumb the squat pen rests I'll dig with it so again I said this earlier he's holding off on making the pen a gun he's now he's digging with it meaning he's not only digging back into the past and remembering his dad and his granddad's hard work, ass-busting labor, but he's also paying homage to these men. This is a remembrance, this is a eulogy, 
This is a commemorative poem, if you will. Now, this poetry anthology, I'm going to do a separate little lecture on it, but when you read a poem that you like, what you're going to do is find a couple of poems that are connected somehow. Be nature, be they about memory, like this poem and the leap, be they about anything. But I want you to post on under discussion what your topic is, what you want to write about, because there's some topics that are way too broad, like love. There's others that are way too narrow. Um, so I'm going to help you out with that. So be thinking about what you want to write about. We're going to get into as this third section of English 102 comes to an end, we're going to talk a lot about this poetry anthology. It's a, you're going to get six poems and one song that are somehow linked together. They can be poems you like, poems you hate. Uh, they can be about war. They can be about mythology. They can be about, again, they can be poems about Ireland, like this one we just talked about. They can be poems about fishing, hunting, and you're going to put them on a P on a PowerPoint. I've got a couple samples. And by the way, the samples that I have posted under discussion, some are good, some are crappy. Um, I just wanted to give you a little taste of the good, the bad, and the ugly. But it's artistic. You know, you're going to put some pictures on it. You're going to have um, the poem and then your analysis of the poem. It's not MLA, so it's it can be first person. It can be... Uh, your thoughts, why you like this poem, or what, why this poem was included in your anthology. You're going to have a works cited. It's going to be the final page, and I have a sample works cited actually posted on D2L. Uh, but be thinking about what you want to write about, because the sooner you know, the quicker I'll be able to say yay or nay in regards to the topic's validity. And I'll also be able to help you find some poems. Most of you're going to find a couple of them using books and because of the way things are going right now libraries are probably closed if you find one on poetryfoundation.org you can use amazon to cite it and i'll show you how to do that i'll, I'll type up a little diagram and post it uh, but i'd like you to get a couple from books and a couple from without going to a bookstore or a library just from sitting where you're sitting right now I'd also like you, though, to get some from PoetryFoundation.org. It's a great web page, and there's a couple other web pages I've listed on D2L, because some are good, some are just trash heaps. Some of them are filled with rubbish, just the, the kind of poems that should be flushed down to the tidy bowl, man. Um, but Poetry Foundation is a, is a winner. It's great. So, um, anyway, those are the poems for the day. Have a good one. I'll be back soon to talk about the next section of poems for tomorrow's class. Adios.